Hello and welcome to Connected. On this edition, Channel 9 newsreader Melissa Down speaks openly about her eight days toughing it out and trekking 250 kilometres across the Simpson Desert. Author of the popular Parish Plessis trilogy, Marianne Dipierre joins us. Bush Rangers are again running from the law in a new Australian feature film and we will go behind the scenes with the director and we'll also have new music from independent artist Aidan Roberts. It's time to keep it local and get connected. Welcome to the program. Imagine leaving it all behind and spending eight days trekking across one of the harshest landscapes in the country. No phones, no beds, no showers and no idea what was about to happen. Well, Channel 9 newsreader Melissa Downs did just that earlier this year when she walked 250 kilometres across the Simpson Desert, all in the name of charity. And I'm very pleased to say Melissa joins us on Connected. How are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. Fully well, recovered. I, I'm glad. <laughs> what prompted you to break out of your comfort zone? Uh, do you know what, um, Young Care, I've been lucky enough to have been involved with Young Care for a few years and uh, when I heard about this particular fundraising event that they had, which is the Simpson Desert Challenge, I just thought, why not? I mean, why not? How often in our lives do we get to do something like that? Mm. And it's such a wonderful charity and I think I'm very lucky because Channel 9 has always uh, had an affiliation with Young Care, so I knew I had the support of the network. Um, which is a big, big deal because part of the part of the event is um, each trekker has to raise a minimum of thirty-five thousand dollars. Right. So you have to have well, you either have to know how you're going to do that or have the support of your employer. So mm. nine was very good, and um, and I I think you you want challenges in your life and. Um, it was a way of, of not playing it safe, getting out there and testing myself in a way that you don't get to do very often. So yeah. I actually, our, our managing director, Kylie Blucher, did it the year before me. So when she did it, even before she went, I said to her, I think I'd like to do it. So obviously we talked about it a lot and knew what she was in for. And I yeah. said, I think I'd like to do it. Do you think it would be something that Nine would, would um, you know, help a, another year and perhaps someone might do it after me as well? Um, and she said, let me do it first, see what it's like. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to send you out there if you're going to potentially die, so let me do it. And, and she did it and loved it. And so then I knew for quite a while that I wanted to do it. And then we just had to, you know, tick all the boxes and make sure it could happen. Of course, part of that too, I mean, when you think about it, the harsh elements that you encountered, yes. the scores of flies, the, you know, <laughs> other, you know, wildlife yes, that you inhabited. Yes. How do you prepare for something like that? Do you know what? In a way, y well, we did training. So we trained for four months leading up to the trek. We trained three times a week. Right. Um, so we did a personal training session one morning a week. We did uh, hill climbing, which was just around Bowen Hills, up and down hills with backpacks. And then on Saturday mornings, we do a 12K trek around Mount Cooper. And that was the physical side. Mm. Um, I suppose the other, the other elements of preparation were we went and visited the Young Care um, accommodation the, the, um, the at Cinnamon Park and also at Woolowin they have a house and we met the young care residents and so we really understood why we were doing it which yeah. I think is important so that when you And they gave you the inspiration. That's right so that when you're out there and you're feeling a bit sad and sorry for yourself because your feet are hurting and you haven't had a bath for six days you think well really what do I have to complain about? Yeah. You think of, of who you're doing it for um, so that was really important, I think, as well for the preparation. And, and then you ask questions. And uh, I can't tell you how much advice I received <laughs> <laughs> about all sorts of things, mostly to do with, um, you know, toileting and hygiene. You wouldn't believe uh, when you say you're going to be in a desert for eight days, how it kind of opens these floodgates for people to give you all sorts of advice about any number of things. Which well, was looking quite at some of the vision of, uh, mm. of uh, the documentary that you yes. also shot while you were yes. there. I mean, this harsh open terrain, yeah. no, no trees hardly, snakes, uh, as we said, scores yeah. of flies. I mean, uh, that would have been some of the worst aspects, wouldn't it, the flies? Yeah, the flies were pretty bad. Um, you, We loved, I mean, we would get up at 
4, 4.30 every morning and start trekking. So the sun didn't really come up till say 6.37. So you'd get those couple of hours in the darkness without the flies and then they would descend and they would mm. be with you all day. And so when you'd stop for lunch, it would be that wave, food in, wave, you know, food <laughs> in, just so that you didn't accident. We all, I'm sure we all ate a fly at some point. Um, but the, you know, the other thing though about the terrain was it was, um, it was actually, uh, there was a lot more scrub, I guess, than we expected. I think we anticipated just those rolling sand dunes, mm. but there was a lot of vegetation because they had had recent rain, um, spin effects. Um, and there was one area we went through and um, the trees, it almost, they almost looked like an olive grove. There were these quite mature trees. Um, so it was, it was quite, it was really interesting. It was a different landscape, but it was magical. And um, to sleep out under the stars one night, we, some campsites were nicer than others. They were a bit more even. Um, you'd have a spade and a rake that you'd try and um, smooth it out a little bit so that when you put your bed mat down, it was a little bit flat. Yeah. Um, but there was one night where it was a really beautiful flat space and there was sort of hills on either side of us and we lay down and looking up, perfectly clear sky, watching the stars move across the, the night sky. It was really magical and then at about 2 a.m., the dingoes started serenading <laughs> us. And I thought, when else in my life will I ever have that experience? And for all the hard for all the hardships, there were many more magical moments that completely outweighed that. Of course we get a little glimpse through the documentary that you shot. Yes. Was it was it difficult also thinking about that while trying to survive the challenge itself? Do you know what it's funny, we all in the beginning we thought, oh I don't know if you know, do we really want the cameras filming when we're s sweating and, and potentially, I don't know, exhausted and, you know, you might get teary or something like that. Um, but you get used to them being around and then you, for you do forget a little bit that they're there. And I think also we just had that idea. We knew why we were there, which was for Young Care, to raise money, to challenge ourselves and and the, the cameras were just there. But I was fortunate because the producer of the show um, is a is a girl who I've worked with for many years. Right. So I trusted her because I know the work that she does. So mm. I think, and she trained with us often as well. So she got to know the other trekkers as well. So we all felt comfortable with um, with the crew. Yep. So I think that made it a lot easier to have them there. But um, but they certainly knew. Um, there were some things you do not film, and, <laughs> and that they were they were fine with that. All right, just quickly, yeah, uh, because we are running out of time. Mm -hmm. But how much did this uh, this trek raise this year? So, of all of the of, with all of the trekkers, we raised I think it was about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and that will go to the Albany Creek uh, Center that Young Care is is currently building. Yeah. So, for us to know that that we can actually go at some point when it's finished, we can go and feel like we, we helped make that happen. That's a really special, special feeling. It's fantastic work that you've helped to create Thank as you. well and also what Young Care does. Yes. Thank you so much for uh, talking pleasure. about your trek. My pleasure. Great. And uh, you can find out more about how you can support the great work of Young Care. Visit their website, youngcare.com.au. Still to come, the legend of the bush ranger, Ben Hall, is set to become a big screen film. And we'll go behind the scenes with director Matthew Holmes. Music also from Aidan Roberts. And sci-fi fans get set. The author of the Parish Places trilogy will be joining us next on Connected. <laughs> And welcome back to Connected. Well, as a regular guest at Supernova and Comic Con, many have had the chance to meet Marianne de Pierre. Uh, she is the author of the popular Parish Placey trilogy, the award winning Sentinels of Orion, and science fiction series, also the game um, uh, of Peacemaker Western Urban Fantasy series. You name it, she's done it. But there is a lot more to this talented author than meets the eye, and I'm very pleased to say that Marianne joins us on Connected. How are you? I'm very well. Uh, one very busy lady. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I like to keep busy. Yeah, keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> You've written so many books, but how did the the journey of writing start for you? Um, I, I actually have three sons, so it it began. I mean, I had wanted to be a writer since I was a child, ten, twelve, you know. Mm. Um, but I kind of lacked the self discipline, and it wasn't really until I had my third son that um, I started to think, what am I going to do with my life? And um, I thought, I'm really going to give this a shot and um, try and be a professional author, write for a living. And so uh, it kind of, so that was in, I was in my thirties by then. 
So, I mean, it's never too too late to start writing, is it? Absolutely not, and that's one of the beauties about it as a career. You can start as late as you want, and you can go as late as you want. I mean, there's fantastic uh, material being produced by authors in their 70s and 80s. Yeah. You know. We're taking a look at some of uh, the books that you have written now. Uh, of course, very much in that science fiction vein. Did that have a... Uh, a big influence for you? Yeah, I, um, my husband, who when he was still my boyfriend, actually gave me my first science fiction novel when I was in my 20s, and it was an Arthur C. Clarke novel, and I started this love affair with science fiction that never really went away. You couldn't start better than Arthur C. Clarke, no. though, could you? <laughs> no, no fan, um, and you know, uh, I read all, cause, because science fiction has so many subgenres, yes. so um, I've read them all and um, enjoyed writing in a lot of them as well. But you also write other uh, genres too, don't you? Uh, yeah, I've written in crime, yeah. um, more down the humorous side of crime. I'm, I'm not a, the forensics kind of hardcore uh, crime. I, I like um, I like the lighter stuff. Yeah, uh, I wrote that under a pseudonym called Marianne Delacourt, and I've written for young adults and teens as well, and children pi children's picture books. Right. Okay. So you're really crossing a lot yeah. of genres there, aren't you? Yeah. Um, uh, of course, with uh, writing and, and and sitting down, it's a very, uh, I guess alone feeling yeah. type of job, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, that's one of the, the hard things about it. And that's why when writers get together at conventions, they're usually quite euphoric yeah. to see another person. <laughs> Look, it's a real life person. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but because that leads you to uh, also uh, what you're doing, which is uh, on the education side, yeah. uh, especially through writers' organisations and giving that feedback to people that, you know, you know, while it might be a, a tough road, it's the rewards are great. Yeah, I've done a lot of um, writing education in the community, like for Queensland Writers Centre and various community-based organisations. But I'm also working out of uh, the universities as well. So right. the University of Queensland, I tutor in writing there as well. I'm actually doing my PhD in creative writing at the moment. So wow. So, yeah. geez, you do have a full plate. Yeah, well, my children are growing up now, so it's a bit easier than it was. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you working on anything at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Always, I like to have a few projects going, and um, I'm writing a science fiction uh, novel for my PhD. Um, and I'm also looking, uh, writing, doing a bit more screenwriting for television. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and I'm writing a series called the Tara Sharp novels, which it's been going for a couple of years, but I'm kind of writing the next one now, which will be book five. Right. Is that Sharpshooter? Yes, that's right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, that's uh, she's a psychic detective. Oh, nice. So it has it's crime, but it has a, just a little bit of a paranormal element to it. So right. So yeah. it's a little bit of the X Files and Agatha Christie thrown in together. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> set, it's contemporary. Set set today. Oh, good, yeah, good, yeah, good. Yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. So uh, w and when you sit down to write something like Sharpshooter, I mean, is it just all of these thoughts popping into your head, or? Yeah, I mean, the ideas are most certainly for professional writers. Ideas are uh, something that we're never short of. It's the time to sit and craft those ideas that that is usually the problem. So life is just one big idea factory as far as I'm concerned, whether it's you know, reading newspaper column or you know, something that happens in your personal life. It, science is great. Um, reading articles about science for science fiction is fantastic. Mm, yeah. Uh, when you get to things like Comic Con and Supernova, I mean, it must be also great for you to be able to meet the fans, not just the fans meeting you. Oh, look, I've had some of uh, the best experiences that I've ever had. Um, at the conventions. Um, in fact, I don't think I've ever had a bad experience. People coming up and being excited about your work and the genre that you're writing in and sharing the love for that genre, it's very gratifying. Yeah. yeah, and of course, I mean, you know, until you hear that, I mean, it's like, as you said about the writer, you don't know what the audience is. It's not like television where you can get the ratings book, is That's it? That's right. That's right. There's nothing nicer than coming up as uh, somebody, a fan or a reader coming up and saying that you've changed my life. I, I think most writers... That's kind of the high point of their writing career when people say that to them. We talked uh, briefly about never too late to start writing. Yes. What's your advice to people that may be thinking about picking up a pen? Um, well, as long, two things, I guess. Um, one is to make sure that you're reading because you'd be surprised how many people think that they'd like to write but they actually don't read a lot. So that sounds very basic and simplistic, but you need to be write, uh, reading in the genre that you want to write. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is to finish everything that you start because um, there's lots of, lot, many writers have many unfinished manuscripts that, right. you, that they can't do anything with. So, but absolutely, it is never too late. 
Well, thankfully, you've got plenty of finished product there for yes. us to pick up. <laughs> and uh, we do thank you so much for ca uh, taking time today to talk to us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Okay. And, of course, uh, you can keep up to date with all the latest news from Marianne uh, through her uh, website, mariannedipier.com. Uh, and up next on The Connected, we take you behind the cameras of the major Australian feature film, The Legend of Ben Hall, and Aidan Roberts with some music. Stay with us. Welcome back to Connected. Well, beginning as a wildly successful crowd-funded short film, The Legend of Ben Hall was rewritten and launched as a full-length motion picture production. It's an epic story as Hall reforms his gang, undertakes a spree of robberies and crimes across New South Wales, and ends with the infamous trio becoming the most wanted men in the colony. The man behind this feature film is producer-director Matthew Holmes, who joins us via Skype from Melbourne. How are you, Matthew? Very well, thank you. Thanks Mate, for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you about this. It's great to see this uh, fantastic film being made. Why did you choose crowdfunding in the first place? Well, because I didn't really have any other way to access um, such a large amount of money to begin with. Um, and it, it seemed like something that I thought people would really get behind. And uh, that was really the two reasons why I chose crowdfunding. Um, I mean, everyone's you know giving it a crack these days, so I thought, why not, why not me? Well, it certainly worked in your case, and of course, and then coming through to the shooting, you did a lot of it down in uh, in Victoria. Uh, was it difficult to find locations that had that historical look and feel? Um, it was. Uh, I wouldn't say it was difficult, but it it, it was challenging. Uh, we had to replicate New South Wales. Um, the the region of Ben Hall in New South Wales has a specific uh, look and landscape, and we had to try to replicate that in Victoria simply because our production was set up down there, and we didn't have the money to go up to New South Wales. So. Um, it was challenging, but we had um, I had some good people who lived up in that region who uh, were a great resource for finding locations and you know talking to property owners and so on. So um, it took a bit of time, but um, we got there. You even had to uh, recreate uh, and build from from the ground up things like huts and, and and buildings, didn't you? Yes, there's nothing from that period that exists anymore that you can use. Uh, so we had to if, anytime we needed a hut or a house or anything like that, we had to either build it. Or we had to find um, some sort of uh, hut or a pioneer village or something like that uh, that was already that was already set up and, and utilised that. Well, of course, uh, the production carried a large cast and crew, as well as uh, I, I guess numerous animal stars, didn't it? Yes. Well, we were we were very fortunate to get um, the help of Australian Movie Livestock, um, who were uh, up in the region where we were filming, um, but they were based up there. Uh, so that sort of became like a bit of a central hub for us and um, because they were so heavily involved in, in the project with, you know, giving us horses and dogs and things like that. So, um, yeah, we were very fortunate to have them on board. If we didn't have them on board, we probably wouldn't have been able to uh, make the film. Yeah, I'm looking at some of the uh, behind-the-scenes footage at the moment, Matthew, and uh, I guess in, in some of these remote locations, was there any challenges? Yes, there is always uh, challenges shooting um, in those locations. Often there isn't good uh, access with um, vehicles and so on. Uh, so we didn't have to build any roads or anything like that, but we did have to um, be very careful about get going onto properties and making sure we had the right vehicles and so on. Um, so it, we had all the challenges of location shooting. We had very extreme weather. Uh, it was going into winter when we were filming the feature, so um, it was starting to get really, really cold. And, uh, and wet and so on, but fortunately not as wet as Victoria can be, so we got kind of lucky. Yeah, uh, how, is, uh, how historically accurate is this film? The film's extremely historically accurate. It was one of the things from the very beginning that I wanted to make, that I wanted to ensure. Um, so I've done a lot of research on the Ben Hall history and I had a historian who was a consultant on the script as well, and we've been working together for nearly 10 years on the script. So we've made sure that um, everything in the film, every character, every event, everything has, has an historical basis. Uh, we've even taken uh, dialogue um, that the gang members actually were reported to have said to themselves and to other people in reports, and we've actually worked all that into the uh, dialogue as well. So it's about as historically accurate as we could have possibly have made it. Well, of course, uh, it's going to be released soon. When, when's the big uh, premiere? Okay, the premiere is going to be sometime in November. Haven't got a date set yet, um, but the theatrical release of the movie in cinemas across Australia is going to be in early December. 
Well, mate, we certainly look forward to that. And uh, I really appreciate you joining us on the program to talk about the legend of Ben Hall. No worries. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Matthew Holmes, the director and producer of The Legend of Ben Hall. And for all the news leading up to the December release, visit thelegendofbenhall.com. And it'll certainly be a film I'm looking out for. Well, musically, Aidan Roberts, his songs inspired relationships, uh, also how the, the world around him is, and love. His debut EP, Ciao Bella, released late last year, takes you with him on a jaunt through the metaphors for love and I know you will love him as well. Please welcome to Connected, Aidan Roberts with his original song, Sailor. The swelling of the green streaked waves captivates me. Wanna go sailing on a ship far out at sea where nobody will disagree with the choices I make. I won't leave a trace, just the white of my wake. Oh. I never thought buried treasure was a very clever move. I would love to be a pirate, but I'm not such a fool. When one sneaky cannonball is all that it takes I won't leave a trace, just the white of my wake oh. Oh. Such a fan of this great green expanse that I'll wade in with the scales, in with the rocks, in with the mantis, as long as an ox, in with the coral, in with the crayfish. In with the eels and their electric shocks And I won't leave a trace Just the white of my wake Oh, fantastic, isn't it? Just wonderful sound there from Aidan Roberts and his song Sailor. Uh, an original composition, always good to see people writing their new music as well. Well, that just about wraps up this edition of Connected. It's been a great show. Melissa Downs talking about her young care trek across the Simpson Desert. Also, of course, uh, Marianne DePierre talking about her line of books and uh, sci-fi writing. And, of course, The Legend of Ben Hall. Looks like a fascinating movie, so I can't wait for that to come out in cinemas across Australia in December to look forward to that one. But, of course, if you'd like to catch up on any information about some of the guests uh, or our web specials, you can do that online as well. All you have to do is visit us on our website, connectedtv.com.au, and you can also interact with the show on our Facebook page as well. But until next time, stay connected and bye for now. Thank you.